Well, we've, uh, this is the last week for this sermon series. It's been seven weeks. I've been talking about relationships as Jesus did them. And um, I, I don't know about you, but each week I kind of see how different things are as, as Jesus um, taught about relationships, how he interacted with other people. And it's definitely not as the world does relationships. And, you know, in the world, you start talking about relationships, and there's always some kind of little trick. You know, well, you need to know how to do this in order to make this work. And you can, you know, your marriage would be better and you get this one little trick. And really, all this stuff is, is really just following Jesus. It's just, it's just looking to him. It's just so simple, you know. And, and yet, uh, for some reason, we miss it. Now, today we come to our last one. Um, this one is from Luke 6, 31. This one you learned as a child. Jesus said, treat others the same way that you want them to treat you. And we call this the golden rule, don't we? Teach our kids this early on. You want to treat other people the way that uh, you want them to treat you. And, uh, you know, there was another rule that we had when I was a kid. Um, you might call it the leather rule. And it was dad's rule. Um, and the leather came from his belt. And it was, you know, just do what I tell you to do. You know, but that rule doesn't really kind of sound like Jesus too much, right? You know, is to do it because I said to do it is was was one of his rules. Still, something that we might use as a parent uh, on small children, not to hit them with a belt anymore, but but definitely to impress upon them that there's times when when we obey. But even as a kid, uh, I had my doubts about this so-called golden rule. If if I treat this person right and, and I put them first, then when am I going to get it be first? What about my needs? Because, you know, I got needs too. And so if it's always about this other person, then why, why do I always have to be last? You know, you, you want to ask this question. Why do I always have to be nice to the guy that's not being nice? And what about me? When, when will my needs be met? And when will it be my day and my term and my time to get what I want and what I need? And here's the answer to this question, you know. Uh, here's the answer to that question and to the question that we, we might really think, but, you know, we don't dare ask it in church. And the answer is, is that I must give myself to meeting someone else's needs if I am going to ever get my needs met. And the only way to get my selfish needs met is to be unselfish. I know that sounds kind of like double talk, but it's true. You know, when we, when we reach out to other people, when we're concerned about them, then strangely, what we needed gets filled. And this, this golden rule is not law. It kind of sounds that way. I think this, you know, you treat, treat others the way you want them to treat you. And it kind of sounds like, well, there's another hard thing that Jesus has given us that we can't do. This is so impossible to do. And this is a truth that, that Jesus is revealing to us about how to walk into the kingdom of God. How about how to kind of create the kind of world in our relationships where things go well. And he says, treat them the way that you want to be treated and you're going to be happy. Your needs will be met when you are concerned about the needs of the other person. Now, the golden rule works almost anywhere in any relationship, not just for Christians. This is a principle just of the world as God has made it. I, I, I learned that in the third century, uh, the Roman em emperor Severus uh, adopted this as his motto of the entire empire. And that was before the empire went Christian. And he had this engraved in his palace on the wall in gold. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And then the other one I thought of was J.C. Penney's. Did you know that J.C. Penney's store, they're almost gone now, I think, but... It used to be a department store in almost every county seat, J.C. Penney's. It, didn't, it wasn't always J.C. Penney's. Back in 1902 when it started, it was called the Golden Rule Store. And that was J.C., that was Penney's uh, motto. He wanted to treat others the way that he wanted to be treated. And his first stores were called that before they changed the name to J.C. Penney's. But the reality is, is that in the world, it's not that way. It's kind of me first, you second. Or worse, right? You look after your own. It's what you do to me, I'm going to do back to you. 
plus interest. That's the way the world talks about it. And in the world, uh, what lies is the, is the motive, you know. They always started it. That's what it always gets down to. Don't you just love it when there's a fight among kids? And what's the parents say? The first thing the parent says is, who started it? Who started this fight? You know, I used to do that. Okay, the kids are fighting. Who started the fight? So if I could just identify the hitter, if I could identify the one kid that's a bad kid and get him out of here or her out of here, then all the other kids would be good, right? That's kind of the theory behind that whole thing as to who started it. Uh, my mom used to always said, uh, who's going to finish it? And, you know, it's like, oh, really? You know, I don't get to finish the, the fight. But the world admires the golden rule, but has a, there are a few imitators. And I want to just uh, go through three, really, mutations of the golden rule. Uh, the first one is the, the, what I would call the reciprocity rule or quid pro quo. As, as we would say, what you do for me is what I will do for you. So you kind of get this arrangement with someone else, and you treat me nice, and I treat you nice. It's the old back scratcher rule. You scratch my back, and I'll scratch yours. And uh, you don't have to be very loving or very intelligent to be able to do this. This is how the business world functions. You form these alliances. I do business with you. You do business for me. That's a that's very effective way of doing things. But it's, you know, what we do there is we just simply kind of ignore the bad kids, the first hitters, and we make our own team. And it's kind of a closed system. Or as Don Corleone said, uh, I do this for you today, maybe sometime you need something, I do something for you, right? But we don't have to be real, you know, moral to do this. It's, a, it's the back-scratching system, and there's nothing wrong, nothing bad about returning kindness to someone. But this isn't the same thing as the golden rule, because here in this reciprocity rule, we assume that we have earned the kindness that is returned to us. We throw some business their way. He didn't give business back. He owes me. He's in debt to me. And if this is all that we have in our relationships is that we give and take back and forth based on what the other person has done, then our relationships are only as strong as the weakness or the, the selfishness of one of the people. So if one person becomes selfish or is weak, then the whole relationship breaks down. We don't get our needs met because they're not returning the love that I gave them, and it all breaks down right there. The second mutation that I think about is the ricochet rule. Uh, this is another variant and an imitation of the golden rule where uh, what I do is based on what someone else has done to me. Someone acts upon me, it ricochets off me, and goes to you. So. The way I have been treated in other relationships, then, is how I'm going to treat you. So this scenario goes something like this. The father comes home from work after being yelled at by the boss all day, okay, and he didn't deserve it. And so he walks into the house, and he chews on the, on the wife. He says, great. So... You told the kids that I would take them to their school event tonight. Well, who made you my boss? And I don't have time to do that, and I'm worn out. And, I mean, if you would actually do some work around the house, then, you know, you'd be worn out too. And so he chews on her. So what does the wife do? She chews on one of the kids, right? Why don't you pick your junk up? You kids are lazy. Your stuff's all over the house. This place is a mess. You kids don't deserve what you've got. So you chews on the kid for a while. So what does a kid do? He kicks the dog. Right. The dog's there. Kick the dog. What does the dog do? The dog goes and finds one of the action figures of the kid and chews the head off. And it just goes down the line. It's called the ricochet rule. How I'm treated is how I treat you. So really, it'd be just make a whole lot more sense if the father would just come home, take the action figure, and chew the head off the action figure, and just leave the other people out of the scenario. Right? Make a whole lot more sense. The third mutation is called the hidden motive rule. Um, the reality doesn't work too well, uh, and probably um, it's the reason for a lot of consumer debt. One person gives something to another person with the motive of getting something from that person. 
So I'm going to be nice to you, but there's a hidden agenda in this be nice to you. So the spouse, um, the spouse gives the wife maybe a romantic weekend away, you know, we go out of town just because he loves her so much. But while they happen to be out of town enjoying this romantic weekend at the bed and breakfast, he lets her know that, yeah, I did order a new set of golf clubs. All right. So how could she get mad in that? So he's, he set her up for it already. So she gets what she wants and he gets what he wants. But there's a hidden motive here because her need, all right, goes to my advantage. And I'm able to get something that I need. Not the same thing as a golden rule. I want, I want us to look at what the message, uh, which is a paraphrase of the Bible, translates this same verse, Luke 6.31. Here's a simple rule of thumb for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. I love the way he put that phrase, grab the initiative. That's really at the heart of what Jesus is saying here. See, the golden rule is, is easy to memorize and it's pretty easy to understand. It's not easy to put into action. How do we unlearn treating other people the way that they treat us? Or treating them the way that someone else has treated us? Or treating them a certain way to get what we want? Most of the time, in our relationships, what happens is there's a huge standoff. You, you didn't do what I needed, so I'm not going to do what you need. We become stubborn. We just kind of dig in. She hurt me. He was rude to me. So that's what he's going to get back. And there's just a standoff in the relationship. We'll see how he likes some of his own medicine. You ever heard yourself thinking that? It really is being stubborn. We know it's wrong. We know it's toxic to the relationship, but we're not going to let the other person win. We would never let him win or her win. And, and let's be honest, sometimes there's enough drama and there's enough energy in this stuff that we actually kind of enjoy the scene. We actually enjoy the play. Who does she think that she is talking to me that way? She started it. She hit me first, more or less. Where's the parent to come in here? So how do we change that pattern? How, how do you end the standoff that we get in some of our relationships? How do you stop the downward spiral? And Jesus says, treat him the way that you would like to be treated. Treat her the way that you would like to be treated. Take the initiative. You be the first one. In the same way that God takes the initiative with us and loves us when we have not loved him, so you do the same thing and you have actions of love towards this person before he or she actually deserves it. On the last day of his life in a human body, Jesus hung on that cross. Uh, he had been almost beaten to death. He had been tortured all night. He had spikes that were in his wrists and in his feet. Every breath that he took was painful as he had to push up on that spike in his foot to, to get enough capacity in his lungs to take a breath. And that's how he lived for the last hours in excruciating pain. Terrible way to die. As he was dying, there were some leaders who were there who had orchestrated this whole thing. They were powerful political religious leaders who had managed to get him up on that cross and they were there as he was going through all that pain and they were laughing at him. That's what they were doing. And they were saying things like, hey, if you're God, why don't you come down? Just prove to us that you're God. Why don't you come down from that cross? And these were, were Jesus's enemies and they were jealous of his popularity. They were jealous of his purity and their whole system was being threatened. And as Jesus heard their words, and he managed to get enough breath in his lungs to, and strength to pray a prayer. Do you remember what his prayer was? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There he was on the cross. He didn't just talk about it. He didn't preach a sermon about it. He did it. 
his actions. Now, now we hear this and we know that we don't have that kind of power. We don't have that kind of purity that Jesus had. And enemies get under our skin, don't they, when someone does something wrong to us or does something wrong to someone that we love. And they make us insecure. We're not, we're not sure. Maybe what they're saying about us has some truth in it, and then it hurts all the more. We want to get even. We want to make it stop. And Jesus was the same way. And he went on from the golden rule. I want you to hear the, the rest of what he said here as we travel, as we go on with Luke 6, beginning with now with verse 32. He says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. And then this last, last part of this. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Well, well we, we can hear all that, and it sounds like law to us. It sounds, you know, oh, there's another impossible thing. Don't miss that last sentence. He himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Jesus says that we can do what he did. We can love our enemies. We can treat each other the way that we want to be treated because we will be sons of the Father and we will be like him. We will be like God. He himself is kind, ungrateful to ungrateful and evil men. That's how we'll be like him, that when we do that, we'll be just like God. Because love is a sacrifice. That's what Jesus lived and taught and did. God is kind when we are ungrateful and evil. He's still kind to us. God is not, you scratch my back and I'll scratch your back kind of God. That's what all the other gods are like. That's what all the false pagan gods are like, is that we do something good in life in order to get God to do something good for us. That's not our God at all. That's not the one true living God. God is good to us even when we are not good to him. Boy, if there's anything I say today that I, I would like for us to absorb and to, and to live in, that is it, is that God is not, I'm going to pay you back if you do something bad, or I'm going to give good to you if you do something good. God is good to those who are not good and evil. It's hard for us to accept, isn't it? Jesus gave even to his enemies. He prayed for his enemies. He treats his enemies the way that he wants to be treated, and that's how God's relationship is to us. God does not punish us when we do wrong, and God does not give good things to us when we are good. That's Santa Claus. That's who that is. Let's not get too confused. Santa Claus is the one that does that. You know, he sees if you're naughty or bad and takes presents away or gives you more. That's not God. Let's not get them confused. God is kind. He's a God of love and grace. Love is, is not, well, you love me and then I'll love you back. That's not the love of God. God's love is I love you regardless of what you do. My love doesn't change. Love is a sacrifice. Relationships are sacrifice. And because of that, I say we can't fall out of love. We have that in our culture where people say, well, we were in love, but we fell out of love. No, what you fell out of was lust is what you fell out of. You didn't fall out of love because you don't fall out of love. Love is an action. Love is loving someone regardless of what they do. I want you to stop and consider that. Jesus showed us what love is when he spread his arms on the cross. That's what love is. It's sacrifice. So Jesus ends his teaching on the golden rule by pointing out the benefits. He says, love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Now, again, I think we hear most of this as law. We hear most of this as here's another checklist that Jesus gives us that if we don't do this, that we're bad people. And that's not what he is saying at all. This is not a law. This is a promise to us. 
Jesus says that, that we can love as he loved. This, this is, uh, Jesus says we can love as he loved. We can take the initiative. We can treat others, even our enemies, with kindness. Because if we seek him, if we walk daily with him. If we follow him, okay, he says that we will become merciful and kind like God. We will be kingdom people. And there's the reward. There's the benefit. Our relationships have God's power in them when we love as he loves. So am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? I mean, this sounds like it's way up here. And my life is living, being lived down here along with everybody else. How am I going to live this relationship life? And here's the thing. Only Jesus can give us the power to treat people the way that he treated people. We can't just try real hard to do this. Only Jesus can give us his power. And what Jesus is promising us is that when we take the initiative and we sacrifice our right to get even through words or, or pouting or lies or stubbornness, that he's creating a new world, a new kingdom world. And then this is the way that that world kind of looks. I was thinking about this as to what if, you know, what if my my kingdom life that I was living in my relationships, what if I didn't have to get the last word in? What if I didn't have to win the argument? What if I didn't have to fire back the text? What if I didn't have to lose sleep, you know, over this, this disagreement that we had? What, what if I didn't believe that some people never change? What if I didn't think that posting an article about something that I opposed is kingdom work or gospel work? What if I didn't think that witch hunting, you know, finding the bad people is gospel work? What if I didn't think that my politics made me better than someone else? And he says, create a new world. You get to treat others, take the initiative to treat others the way that you would like to be treated, and you create a new kind of relationship here in your relationships. Now, this is the end of the series, and, and I want to make, make one final point. Uh, before we close this up. Most people have, most of us have a, an idealized view of family and our relationships that uh, so much in our head as we th how think how things should be and it's, it's really not real. And we, we have this picture up here and because we have this picture, we can't see what we really have. So um, an idealized family evening goes something like this. Maybe, maybe you identify. This is what we have in our mind is how life is supposed to be. You get home about 5.15 after having a wonderful day, driving through very light traffic with people that don't cut you off. Nobody runs a red light. Everybody's courteous to you. As you enter the house, everyone is at the door and they run to see you and they're so glad to see you and all hugs and loves you, love you is all around and then the, the entire family pitches in together to make dinner. Uh, it's pasta night, so one of the children makes the homemade pasta and another one of the kids is making the homemade bread. And um, you go out into your weedless garden to gather a few organic tomatoes to make the pasta sauce. Got it? During the meal, the conversation is engaging. There's no cell phones there. Everyone shares the best thing about their day. Everyone has perfect manners. And then you clean up the dishes. Everybody helps together. This takes about three minutes to get the dishes cleaned up. And the kids voluntarily say, I've got to go do my homework. And they run up to do their homework. And without any helping or prompting, and you sit in your easy chair and read your favorite magazine. And when the homework is done, instead of a usual evening of board games or working together in the garden, you realize that tonight you must shoot that documentary for PBS on the Happy American Family, which you do, and there's a good mix of laughter and antidotes and even a few tears from, from some things. And, you know... And then off to bed, the kids go by themselves. And as they go upstairs, you hear from upstairs, 
Good night, John Boy. Good night, Mary Ellen. <laughs> and then you wink at your spouse and the candles are brought out for a romantic evening as every night is and you fall asleep in each other's arms. The American dream, right? We probably have some image of that in our mind is how that's how life's really supposed to be. Now, what actually happens is this. You get off work about 7.30 because you had to stay late at the end of the office and there's terrible traffic. You eat cold pizza because the family ate without you. Then you try to help your eighth grader with algebra that you never even got when you were in college. Then after threats and complaints, the kids go to bed or at least they close the door and go into their own private little world of texting and chatting and stuff. And you grab the remote control and the intimacy that you enjoy is a hit on the arm when your spouse says, it's 12 o'clock, you fell asleep in your chair again. Welcome to America. This is American life. That is real. That other picture is not real. We idolize our relationships. We idolize life as to how it should be. And the goal of love is not some false picture, but it's, but it's seeing God at work right now in the normal, not so perfect life that we have. And we can make an idol out of the ideal. But God wants to be in us and be real. Take your life right now and give it to God. Don't take your idolized life. Take your real life. If you believe in God, then move into believing God, believing that he wants to do something in your life today as it is, not when it gets perfect. Believe that God is working right now in your life. Believe him to empower you to love and to treat others as he treats you. The circumstances in life, in your life are not perfect. You're not perfect. The people you love are not perfect. Ah, but God is perfect. So instead of trying to perfect the imperfectible, focus on praising the one who is perfect. And it's then that we get the power to love as he loves. When we praise God, not for how I see my life could be, but for how I see that you're working in my life today. There's where we begin with our gratitude, what he is giving to us. Let's, let's pause for a few moments.